At first despised, later much admired, submarines have polarized opinion ever since their creation. Nazi propaganda hailed them as wonder weapons, and they continue to bask in a myth of invincibility. Submarines have gone from being what we regard as ineffectual toys to being these immensely powerful beasts that are incredibly complex and now carry enough power, potentially, to destroy the whole planet. Submarines are extremely sophisticated machines, brimming with technology and weaponry. The complexity of their construction is as impressive as their power to destroy. Innovation and captivation, danger and destruction, the two faces of submarines. The moment the submarine came to the world's attention as a weapon was marked by a drama that took place in 1915. The Lusitania was the largest ocean liner of its time. On the 1st of May, the British luxury liner set sail from New York. The First World War had already been raging for nine months when the high-speed steamship, with almost 2,000 people on board, made its way towards Liverpool. Hardly a single passenger could ever have imagined the catastrophe that lay ahead. A few of them had spotted an unusual advertisement in the newspaper, a warning signed by the Imperial German Embassy in the USA. She was warned by newspaper adverts that there was a chance she could be attacked by submarines and sunk. And everybody that went on board would, if they read the newspapers, know about that, and that was a risk. But I guess because liners are fast and also pretty big, they didn't think that a, a mere submarine could sink the Lusitania. From the start of construction, the British government earmarked the Lusitania as a potential auxiliary cruiser, meaning facilities were provided for the installation of weapons and the like from the outset. She was, therefore, placed on the corresponding lists under the auspices of the German Reich. The Germans declared a war zone around England in February 1915 and declared that all ships, all British ships, not the neutral ones, would be sunk without warning. That was, so to speak, a counter-blockade to the blockade imposed by the British. It was the start of sinking ships without warning, and it was quite clear that this included large passenger ships, because these passenger ships could also be used for military purposes. Passagierschiffe gehören, weil diese Passagierschiffe waren auch militärisch verwendbar. On the 7th of May 1915, the German submarine U-20 was patrolling waters north of the British Isles. The attack on the passenger ship was launched just after 2 p.m. 1,198 people were killed. The German commander, Walter Schwieger, was responsible. The commanding officer ordered a single torpedo to be fired. It was very unfortunate that it struck the Lusitania at such a vulnerable point. The Lusitania sank as a result of a relatively primitive torpedo hit, a major shipping disaster, 1,200 people dead, including about 120 Americans. The civilized world was shocked the incident would culminate in the USA joining the war against Germany. What didn't help the German cause uh, was the uh, celebration of it in Germany and also even medals being struck celebrating the sinking. And so what happened then was that the British side, the Allied side, could then pick up on that and point to Germany as being somehow different and being some kind of uh, beastly power that was killing babies and uh, women and children in the sea. And uh, in reality, the sinking did serve uh, the Allied cause in the war. The Lusitania brought the issue of submarine warfare onto the diplomatic stage, onto the international diplomatic stage, beyond just the British and the Germans, making it an American issue as well. The fear of being ambushed by a submarine is no less today. 
In the service of national navies, they cruise inside the world's oceans, better camouflaged than ever before. In terms of size, diving depth, propulsion and armaments, the submarines of international navies vary considerably, but there is one thing they all have in common. They operate deep under the ocean's cover. These days, modern submarines are multifunctional, high-performance machines that cost billions and can reach depths of up to 600 meters. They can be home to an entire arsenal of weapons. The story of submarines began, however, a long time ago. The first experiments with underwater vessels took place as early as the mid-19th century. Submarines come out of their depths, and that's what makes them special. They come out of hiding. At the same time, people have extremely limited knowledge of how a submarine actually works. From the technical to the operational, it's a mystery, and mysteries always interest people. The early submarines were really quite primitive when it came to uh, what you might call uh, life support. They, uh, when they closed their hatches, they would have air inside, and that was all you had to breathe. The evolution of submarines mirrors technological progress. Designs range from individual diving suits to one-man submersibles to larger constructions. The most primitive submarines were powered by hand cranks and other mechanical devices. Their potential for military use was spotted early on. The first deployment of a submersible in wartime was in the American Civil War in 1864. The CSS Hunley was the first submersible to sink an enemy ship. The engineer, Horace Lawson Hunley, financed and coordinated its construction for the Confederate Navy to break the Union blockade. He died on a test dive. With nine men hand-cranking ducted propellers, the Hunley set off to war in February 1864. Although its torpedo succeeded in sinking the enemy ship, it took the crew with it. Man's desire to go underwater is the same as a climber who simply climbs a mountain because it's there. There was a third dimension that man wanted to explore. Man's desire to dive is rooted in the nature of human curiosity. I think it's comparable to man's desire to fly. People have always sought to expand their natural limits since the beginning of time. Underwater vessels cemented people's faith in technical progress, like the Nautilus in Jules Verne's novels. To generations of readers, the floating research station in 20,000 leagues under the sea was synonymous with submarines. The character of Captain Nemo inspired scholars and scientists alike to push back the boundaries of the possible. Jules Verne was somebody who laid out a vision for what submarines could be, and that actually included undersea exploration, because in that novel, uh, he does go and explore the wonders of the deep. That is true. He synthesized that whole uh, evolution that was underway at the time, and then showed where it could go. On the eve of the 20th century, most of the world's navies were either developing or deploying submarines as a weapon of warfare. This would not have been possible without the technological leaps and bounds made during the Industrial Revolution. Factories were able to mass-produce arms and ammunition. Steam, electric and diesel-powered engines were tried and tested and soon replaced mechanical devices. Modern technology changed the face of warfare, something that became particularly evident in the First World War. At the turn of the century, underwater vessels with a modern steel construction came into vogue, making them ideal for military use. At the same time, the torpedo was invented, the only real weapon suited to a submarine. Submarine mania broke out in France. 
The first vessels were built as early as 1888 and put into naval service. Initially battery-powered, they later ran on steam. By 1904, the French Navy was the proud owner of 10 combat-ready submarines. Several models were built in the wake of the Fashoda incident between Britain and France and the colonial race for Africa. The Americans also began to experiment with submarines at an early stage. In 1888, the US Navy announced a competition for submarine designs. Won by Irish-born John Philip Holland, he went on to do pioneering work in developing submersibles for the military. The Navy used them primarily for training purposes and to gather greater underwater experience. A submarine was built in Britain and delivered to the Ottoman Navy. Even then, submarines didn't have any real military value. There were simply too few of them at the turn of the century, and a lack of operational experience rendered navies cautious. The prime movers in terms of practical classes of submarines were the Germans, and the British, but the French Navy was uh, adept at creating uh, reasonably effective submarines as well. And uh, I think that uh, the main problem was in people's perception of what submarines were and who were these people in submarines. They didn't seem to be very uh, savoury people. And so they were, they were thinking that what they should do is perhaps try and ignore the submarine until they were forced into actually having some. The German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, was particularly enthusiastic about large, prestigious ships such as the luxury steamer SS Bismarck, whose launch he honoured in Hamburg in June 1914. Wilhelm II was an emperor who was extremely enthusiastic about the navy. To him, the navy was the instrument which could help Germany achieve world renown. Submarines only interested him marginally in this respect. He focused on capital ships, battleships. Until then, Germany had never been a major seafaring nation. This was to change under Wilhelm II. His ambitious plan to upgrade the fleet in a gigantic program to become the second largest fleet in the world after the British. And there was an arms race in the early 20th century, primarily uh, between uh, Britain and Germany, but obviously involving other nations. And the Germans initially looked at early submarines and said these things are never, ever be any use and we should be better off building battleships because that's who we want to beat, the British with their battleships. The Kaiser and his admirals continued to pump money into building powerful battleships and armoured vessels, investing billions. To generate income for his ambitious naval plans, the Kaiser introduced a tax on sparkling wine and champagne in 1902, money which flowed directly into the construction of the Kaiser Wilhelm Canal and the Imperial Fleet. Prestigious ships with sizeable crews were meant to show the potential enemy, Great Britain, that Germany was its match on water as on land. The first German submarine, however, was only commissioned by the head of the Imperial Naval Office, Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, in 1904. The floating vessel with the name U-1 was a technical innovation it was able to dive to a depth of 30 metres and remain underwater for 12 hours. It's worth pointing out that the first submarines were not really submarines. They were submersibles that travelled on the surface at a speed of about 15 knots. That's almost 30 kilometres an hour. And they only dived when there was an alarm. For example, if there was some threat coming from a ship or an aircraft. Submarines were superfluous to military planning because they were basically poorly regarded. Warfare was always something chivalrous. Submarines were anything but that. That explains why this modern weapon was initially viewed with such 
Indifference. Weshalb man erstmal auch auf diese Waffe eigentlich gleichgültig schaut. The U-1 was built at the Germania shipyard, a long-standing dockyard in Kiel, which had already built four submarines for the Imperial Russian Navy. The threat of confrontation with Japan in February 1904 prompted the Russians to place orders throughout Europe to expand their fleet. Today, the world's most modern submarines are launched in Kiel. They have little in common with early designs. Although the huge pressure hull still protects the crew and equipment from the enormous water pressure at depth, the dimensions are entirely different today. About 90 kilometers of cable, 40 kilometers of pipes, and around 6,000 sensors are crammed into the 60 meter long pressure hull. In terms of diving depth, equipment, armament and size, modern submarines couldn't be more different to their early predecessors. Modern technology has paved the way. It can take up to six years to build a conventional submarine today, including a testing period. The submarines being built in Kiel today are not amongst the largest. They are conventionally powered submarines which, unlike the large nuclear submarines, are not powered by a nuclear reactor. These German vessels have the advantage of being smaller, quieter and extremely difficult to detect. Like the Type 212 Alpha. In terms of the signatures, how stealthily a submarine can move, the Type 212 Alpha is extremely difficult to detect. Nearly all submarines can do the same thing. That is, dive and resurface, pick up signals, communicate effectively, but the level of noise differs. For a submarine to dive and resurface, it has to have what are called ballast tanks. These are compartments that are flooded with water to increase the weight and help the vessel to sink. Filling the cells with high pressure air is called blowing, causing the boat to resurface. When sailing on the surface, conventional submarines generate electricity for the electric motor via a diesel generator that requires air. When submerged, the submarine relies on propulsion independent of air, for example through modern fuel cell technology. It generates electrical energy from oxygen and hydrogen, which is then stored in batteries and supplies the engine. The development of fuel cell technology began in Kiel as early as the 1980s. In 2005, the shipyard used the innovative technology for the first time on a submarine of the German Navy. The propulsion system, which relies on the generation of energy from oxygen and hydrogen and is not dependent on outside air, is considered groundbreaking. Compared to the decades before, where primary efforts were invested in underwater endurance, that is, how long a submarine can stay underwater, the new fuel cell technology actually resulted in a revolution. It increased underwater endurance from a few days to several weeks, enabling a completely different outlook on potential naval missions worldwide. Contrary to the experience of the First World War, today submarines are highly complex machines and true technological marvels. They can only be operated by specialists. You can operate a submarine like the ones we build today with two men. But when it comes down to it, a submarine is not designed to sail in peaceful waters, but to operate in conflict missions. Otherwise, you could operate every part of the board technology by hand straight away. The company has developed a virtual training program for its clients. In the digital submarine, each step could be practiced for every individual operational detail on board. Close Wolf, India 8-9. 
Roger, close valve, India 89. Before they even go to sea, crews can become acquainted with the complex technology. Valve India 89 is closed. Roger. This level of technology was unimaginable at the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914, when Imperial Germany began to mobilize its soldiers. Millions of men went to war, not just on land. To cut off the import of raw materials for the German war effort, the British imposed a naval blockade with the aim of starving the enemy. For fear of the superior British fleet, not a single ship of the German Navy left the safety of its harbour. At the outbreak of the war, the naval superpower Great Britain boasted the largest fleet with 76 submarines. The key point is that although the major naval powers all had submarines in 1914, if only just a handful, they were technically very unreliable. The naval focus remained on large battleships. That's how naval experts thought at the time. You have to have a submarine because the others have one too. But what can you do with them? And that wasn't at all clear at the outbreak of war in August 1914. In comparison, the German Navy only had 28 submarines at the time, but they were soon put to use, manned by a crew made up entirely of volunteers who were willing to test the waters with this little-known vessel. The commanders were relatively young, men of around 20, 30 years of age. The rest of the crew wasn't older, they were all youngsters. We did attract a certain kind of adventurous, risk-taking, piratical sort of person, somebody that would take a risk and be very daring and didn't care about convention and wouldn't be overawed by the thought of battleships. Uh, bearing down on them at, at high speed. Operating these machines is tough and dangerous. It's both a seafaring and a military challenge. Moreover, at the time of the First World War, life on board was incredibly uncomfortable. A crew of 24 was squeezed into the space between diesel engine and torpedoes. In the early days of submarines, there was no heating. The air was thick with oil from the diesel engine's exhaust fumes, which circulated on board when underwater. It wasn't possible to take a shower because of the limited water supply. 24 men had to share one toilet, so toilet time was limited. Michael Setzer used to work on a submarine in the German Navy, initially as a young officer of the watch in the early 1980s, later as a commander on U-27 and U-14 boats during the Cold War. Today, the Hamburg native is president of the Association of German Submarine Officers. At the time of the First World War, and for a long time afterwards, submarine crews were all male. Women were denied any access. Even within the Navy itself, submarine crews had a special status. The battleship admirals looked down upon submariners and thought they were disgusting creatures. And, and to be honest, they were pretty disgusting because in, in their tiny submarines, they uh, worked in an environment with uh, foul air and uh, quite frequently they were, they were sick on, on themselves and all over the submarine. And a lot of them did not even have... Um, toilets, so they were pretty unsavory and pretty, pretty stinking. Reconnaissance vessels soon turned into predators, mainly hunting British merchant and cargo ships. Submarines became the key to breaking the British blockade. On the 22nd of September 1914, submarine commander Otto Wedigen pulled off a surprise coup. Wedigen and his boat, the SMU-9, sank three British armoured cruisers enforcing the blockade off the Dutch coast. A total of 1,459 British sailors drowned or perished in the shipwreck. 
Britain found itself in a state of shock and horror. I think the effectiveness of the submarine was something that came crashing home in the Royal Navy and in British society. So that horrified the British public that suddenly, out of nowhere, there could be a torpedo wipe away hundreds of lives. And this incident sparked off a submarine euphoria in Germany and created a myth that lasted the whole of the First World War. It was a bug in the public's ear. Everyone thought that the Germans had found a wonder weapon to defeat England. The German Navy, with its prestigious high seas fleet, was lying idle in port at the time. People came up with the saying, the Vaterland is dozing, the fleet isn't cruising. And then suddenly a submarine comes along and shows what can actually be done. The personality of Weddingen is key to this. German submariners were hailed by the public as heroes. The image of the U-boat commander as a silent hunter did the rounds. These were people it was easy to project heroic deeds onto. These days you would say they were ideal for a PR campaign. They were the embodiment of success. You could count how many ships they sank, what the gross register tonnage of damage they did was, and thus easily gorged their military fleets. And that element of competition, of measuring yourself against the enemy, almost in a sporting way, that really suited the submarine commanders, who were all young, unmarried, charismatic and smart, the kind of boy groups of today. The glorification of heroes had little to do with the reality and dangers faced by the crews on their mission. Today, young submariners have to face a reality that couldn't be more different, even during their training. At the naval base in Eckenförde, the first submarine squadron trains its new generation. For a good two years now, the training center on the Baltic Sea has been home to a state-of-the-art submarine simulator. The simulator can duplicate all movements and positions of a submarine underwater. Everyone who has the ambition of working on a Navy submarine has to pass through this simulator at some point. The submarine crew consists of 29 men and women, and everyone on board is essential. We can't afford to train people after they've gone to sea. There's no leeway for redundancies or spare capacity. In the replica command center, the future specialists learn about sonar detection. A submarine has no windows, of course. It wouldn't make much sense, as it's pretty dark down in the sea. But a submarine has highly developed sensors which listen to sounds in the water and pick up sounds from the surface. Locating acoustic signals is one of the most important tasks of a submarine. And just as important, the officer on watch. Today, women can finally do this job, even though they are still outnumbered. As officer of the watch, you're in charge of the submarine nautically and operationally, in lieu of the commander, as he can't do his job around the clock. I'm in charge of the watch. I make decisions about our course and other navigational issues. I'm the point where all the information comes together operationally. After a year of training on land, submarine students have to prove their skills in practice. Of course, emergencies are also rehearsed. When something goes wrong, it's usually a matter of life or death, or can quickly become that. Imagine a fire. The fire burns the oxygen in the air, which means that in an area that's locked, a fire is much more dangerous than in an area where I can open a window or a door or a bulkhead. 
or where I have a ventilation system. The trainees have to apply everything they've learned during a two-week training and examination voyage. And they have to function as a team. Part of the program, periscope drills. Trainees perform their first tactical maneuvers with the observational telescope. Fahrfort mit Seeraumüberwachung. Beginn auf der Fehmarn. Links 30, 1150. Schnell auf 40 Meter gehen. Schnell auf 40 Meter gehen. The watch officer is the only crew member who can see outside. Only his or her observations and calculations matter. Many a trainee reaches their limits in practice. Practicing in the simulator ultimately has little to do with operating on a real submarine. When the submarines were launched in the First World War, there was no thought of such professional training. From 1914 onwards, the war raged as relentlessly at sea as it did on the European mainland. On the 31st of May 1916, the high seas fleets of the Imperial Navy and the Royal Navy clashed at Skagerrak. It was the opening move in one of the greatest naval battles in history, and a trial of strength between the two most powerful navies of the time. Losses were high on both sides, but the battle did little to change the course of the war or end the naval blockade imposed by the British. The Battle of Jutland was the greatest ever confrontation of two fleets that had taken place at that time, although it didn't bring about the turning point in the war at sea. In its aftermath, the Kaiser found himself being put under pressure by Tirpitz to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, which had temporarily been reined in after the sinking of the Lusitania. The Battle of Jutland resulted in a strategic shift in naval warfare to stages underwater. German U-boats in particular were often considered barbaric for ambushing and sinking British freighters and killing their crews. Submarine warfare has several phases. At times it's carried out according to price law, at others according to international law. The submarine stops a ship and checks it. The crew is safe and then it's sunk. That's always been the nature of naval warfare. German strategists recognized the capability of submarines to launch an ambush attack as their greatest potential. The admirals joined in on this heated debate, saying it was essential to hit Britain with everything they had and bring down the perfidious Albion Isles until all their weaponry and restrictions were gone. Germany declared unrestricted submarine warfare three times, without the promise of warning. It also temporarily withdrew the declaration twice. More than 3,000 British merchant ships and fishing boats were sunk. The German U-boat came to symbolize this surreptitious form of naval warfare. Striking without warning, out of hidden depths, German submarines were perceived as insidious and unsoldierly. And then these German U-boat commanders just started playing battleship. The Germans had a simple goal, to sink as much shipping tonnage as possible, and thereby cut off the supply chain of raw materials to enemy Britain. In the process, nearly 15,000 British sailors lost their lives. The Royal Navy's submarines set about hunting German U-boats while supporting battleships in the blockade in the Baltic and patrolling the Mediterranean. In British and Allied propaganda, the German U-boat came to symbolize treachery, cruelty and inhumanity in naval warfare, publicizing attacks on innocent civilians and passenger ships like the Lusitania.
The sinking of the Lusitania ultimately forced the hand of American President Woodrow Wilson to reconsider his stance on the war and America's active participation. Germany's renewed proclamation of unrestricted submarine warfare two years later was the final push for America to join the war in April 1917. The USA's superior resources shifted the balance of power in Europe in favour of the alliance between France and England. At sea, the German U-boats became prime targets and started to suffer increasing losses. Guns and depth charges were used to eliminate the treacherous submarines. Those who suffered most from the unrestricted submarine warfare were not least the crews of the submarines themselves. They often spent weeks living in these poorly equipped, narrow metal tubes. Their lives were constantly in danger, nor were they in a position to decide the war, even with the greatest of efforts. A key difference between World War I submariners compared to submariners today is that crews in the First World War had to endure enormous psychological pressure. There was only a slim chance of coming home unscathed. About 5,000 crew members were killed in action in German U-boats in the First World War. 184 of more than 300 submarines owned by the German Navy were lost. Despite a handful of victories, the supposed wonder weapon failed to play the decisive role in the naval war against Britain. Following capitulation, a few German U-boats and their crews ended up as British prisoners of war. The victorious powers were particularly interested in the German submarine's highly efficient propulsion systems. The First World War came to an end on the 11th of November, 1918. Here in Paris, as in many cities, people celebrated the end of the war. Large swathes of German weaponry remained in the hands of the victors, including a German submarine. The Treaty of Versailles brought the First World War to an end both on paper and under international law. The peace agreement imposed strict conditions on Germany's navy, limiting the number of battleships to just six and prohibiting the navy from building or even owning submarines. A heated international debate arose about whether to hold on to the controversial notion of submarines as a weapon of warfare. The Germans, well, they were banned completely from having submarines, from operating them, and from building them on German soil. So they were kind of out of the picture. But the British did try to get them banned and failed. So I would say, to sum it up, that submarines were viewed as a terrible weapon, one that should not really be in existence. But in the end, if you were a smaller navy that wanted to reach some kind of parity with the British fleet, and somehow equalize your, your war power, then you would say, actually, we're going to keep submarines. And that's what happened. So submarines remained in the picture. They became the weapon of the underdog, the little man's bludgeon, a weapon calling for relatively few means, but with a considerable effect. These small nations, Germany in particular, then continued to develop submarine tactics, ultimately ensuring their role as an effective weapon in the Second World War. Top naval commanders from all nations involved in the war recognized the advantages of submarines over large and expensive battleships. Submarine construction continued, especially in France, Britain and the US, not in large numbers, but with new and improved models. British submarines built between the wars were, like American ones, designed largely for the scenario of a potential Pacific war. They were larger and more comfortable than the later German World War II submarines. France also continued construction and exported models to Greece, Latvia, Yugoslavia and Poland.
when Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, the German Navy didn't have to start from scratch in reactivating its submarine weaponry. Despite the constraints imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, those in charge had continued to work in secret. The Führer, however, had little interest in submarines. Hitler was an army man, land warfare. He was a soldier in the First World War. His naval adjutant said that Hitler was scared of the sea. He got seasick quickly. It was not his thing. He had practically no understanding of naval matters. U-boats remained a popular propaganda tool in 1930s Germany, despite the fact that they'd had no lasting impact on the outcome of the First World War and that many submariners had never returned home. In 1933, the German submarine film Morgenrot was released in cinemas, portraying patriotic young men and the heroic deaths of two submarine officers who die for their country. The film was followed by several jingoistic submarine sequels. The depiction of submarine warfare was very positive at the time because throughout the 1920s there was a discourse which celebrated their military achievements. It was essential to maintain the positive image of the German military and submarines were a part of that. Everybody glorified them a little bit as if they were the heroes of the great war which somehow Germany had actually won. A submariner generally has a less spectacular view of the whole thing. But since there are only a few of them, it's easy to pertain the myth which persists. Of course, submariners themselves are loath to undermine it. On the contrary, they fuel it through their close ties and that certain esprit de corps. German shipyards like this one in Kiel saw the resumption of submarine construction at the end of 1933, initially in secret and openly from 1935. Construction was increased due to submarines' relative low costs in the face of their maximum effectiveness in sinking ships. Class 7 submarines were a natural development from their predecessors in the First World War. They were state-of-the-art in terms of their diving depth, attack strength and propulsion power, especially the famous Type 7C submarine. The Type 7C was the most important submarine in the Second World War. They operated primarily on the water's surface and only dived in rare cases. You can see that in the shape of the hull, as is the case with the most famous German submarine, which you can see today in La Boe on dry land. The bow of the submarine is shaped like a classic ship's bow like a knife blade that just cuts through the waves on the water. The first boat of this type was launched in April 1940. It measured just under 67 meters from bow to stern. Naval historian Axel Niesler is an expert on Type 7 submarines. He knows the ins and outs of the Second World War's most famous U-boat like no other. Twenty-one months were needed to build a Type 7C from scratch, so to maximize output, more than a dozen shipyards from Emden to Danzig worked simultaneously. This is the diesel engine room. Two identical diesel engines with a maximum of 1,400 horsepower propelled the boat when it was afloat. These diesel engines powered the boats to a maximum speed of up to 17 knots, 
That's a little over 30 kilometers an hour. Generally, the boat wasn't particularly fast, but the engines were very economical. The prime goal was to save fuel. Maximum speed was only used for tactical purposes, for example, when pursuing an enemy or in an evasion maneuver. Otherwise, it kept at a steady six to seven knots. That's pretty much the speed of a slow bicycle. Das heißt mit äh, etwa äh, langsamer Fahrradfahrgeschwindigkeit. The narrow boat was home to a crew of up to 52 men. Most of the interior, which was about four and a half meters wide, was crammed with equipment and torpedoes. The spherical bulkhead is a special bulkhead because it separates the central area from the front part of the boat. A Type 7 sea boat is divided into three watertight compartments. Each compartment is separated from the other by a pressure-proof bulkhead. Pressure-proof means that this bulkhead can withstand a diving depth of at least 100 meters without being damaged. Basically, if one of these pressure-proof compartments leaks due to water intake, and this water intake cannot be controlled in any way, then the boat is so heavy that it will sink. If that happens, then the boat command was advised to bring the boat to the surface immediately, no matter what it took, without delay. Put simply, it meant blowing with everything you have. Forcing water out of the ballast tanks and, with a bit of luck, allowing the boat to resurface. There were 10 torpedoes stored in this space, four each in the tubes, four below the corridor plates and two above the carriage plates between the bunks. Here at the rear is the so-called double-acting electric motors which power the propulsion. In front of that is the actual engine, also inside, which is also driven either by compressed air or by electricity. Then, at the very front, is the most important part for the torpedo, the explosive charge, which is packed in here at the front. We're talking about a highly explosive charge of 280 kilograms. We're talking about 280 kilograms of high explosive charge that is here in here. Munitions against the superior Allied fleet, which Germany brought into play after invading Poland on the 1st of September 1939, the start of the Second World War. In Gdansk Bay, the training ship Schleswig-Holstein fired at onshore targets. Hitler's navy was unprepared for war. The German Navy was extremely weak, and the U-boat was the best way of turning this around. The Germans were a land power, a strong army, but were very weak at sea. The deployment of U-boats made them a sea power to be reckoned with, or at least perceived as a threat. An incident just two days into the war proved how dangerous German submarines were. The passenger ship, Athenia, had departed from Europe during peacetime, sailing from Glasgow to Montreal with more than a thousand passengers on board. That ship should never have been sunk, even under German rules, because they were trying to abide by certain protocols that did not allow attacks on liners in particular areas. On the 3rd of September 1939, the German U-30 boat was patrolling off the north coast of Ireland when, at some point in the afternoon, the commander, Fritz Julius Lemp, aged only 26, spotted the British-flagged Athenia. Before assessing the situation fully, the commander classified the ship as a troop ship and fired three torpedoes at 7.40 in the evening. One hit its target. 118 people drowned in the freezing cold Irish Sea. No Germans came to the rescue. 
The commander saw the attack as a legitimate act of war because he'd mistakenly identified the Athenia as a troop ship. When he became aware of his mistake by listening to the radio transmissions broadcast from the sinking ship, he did not do what he should have done under international law. If a civilian ship is sunk, it's international law to help rescue the survivors. But the German commander stole away, violating international law for the second time. This matter of international law, which dictates when it's legitimate for a submarine to sink a ship, what is acceptable in breaking a blockade and what is not legitimate, all that was effectively redundant in the Second World War. Boats sunk each other with surprisingly little hesitancy. The German Reich increased its submarine building program, soon making the underwater killing machines the decisive element of the war at sea. The Second World War saw the acceleration of submarine warfare like never before, and even more ruthlessly. The Pax of Grey Seawolves initially celebrated major military successes. Only when the Allies made breakthroughs in decoding enemy radio traffic did the tide turn in their favour. Each passing decade has seen submarines becoming larger and more powerful, but at the time of the Second World War, their supposed greatest triumphs and the development of gigantic nuclear submarines with nuclear weapons were still to come.